Hello everyone, welcome back to Relax with Animal Facts. I am Steph Wolf, and today we are going to be learning about our furry, scaly, or possibly even slimy friends. Well, in today's case, it's going to be a furry friend. We're looking at the tiger today, um, a, a very majestic, beautiful animal, um, as per the suggestion of one of our special listeners out there. So this is a lis- uh, special listener episode from Crystal in the United States. Thank you so much for writing into the show. For any of you that want to see your animal featured on the podcast, you can go ahead and um, send an email to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com and I will reply. Um, And um, you can get shouted out on the podcast and uh, most importantly, learn about an animal that that you'd like to learn about. So um, the tiger, one that I have no um, kind of personal, um, I have never seen a tiger in person before. Um, I've seen them in videos and stuff like that, but it is one of those animals that I ha- do not have a lot of experience with personally. Um, so I'm very excited to get into them and, and learn a little bit. Um, so just a disclaimer, I am not a biologist. I, um, I am just somebody who uh, is interested in animals, just like all of you listeners out there, um, who is learning with you. So all of these facts, I am I, they're totally new to me. Um, so I got these facts from Discover Wildlife, Animal Planet, um, one website which uh, was a national park, Rantham, Rantham Boar National Park, and WWF.ca. So we have the Discover Wildlife, Animal Planet, we have the National Park, and the WWF. Um, so we have some um, return sources, I guess you could say, many sources that we've used before. Um, So why don't we just get right into the show? So the first fact is that tigers are the only big cats to have stripes and individuals can be identified by their pattern. So we've seen this in animals before where identification can really differ from species to species. And in the case of the tiger, it really has to do with their stripes. Um, And when it comes to predatory adaptations, because those of you who have maybe seen tigers at a zoo by chance, um, you wouldn't expect really... um, their bright orange and black stripes to blend in to, um, you know, the greenery that, that uh, zoos usually portray. Um, but the predatory adaptation is not that high up on the priority list for the stripes. Um, but we do, we do have to keep in mind that, of course, tigers do not live in enclosures in the real, you know, in the wild. Um, green vegetation is not as common in the, um, uh, in the habitats where tigers usually live. Um, I th- when I think of tigers, I usually think of the, the kind of long, um, long yellow sort of um, bushes that they're able to, to kind of go around in. I don't see them very much um, going towards uh, green vegetation. But um, of course, we also have to remember that we, we, we are primates, um, us humans, and we can detect different ranges of colors um, in a way that many animals don't. Um, for example, to an animal that does not have that same kind of color range, maybe the, um, maybe those uh, really contrasting colors will be harder to pick out in, in long grass. So we just have to remember that, um, not all animals see things the way us humans do. Of course, we don't have the best vision when it comes to, um, the animals in the animal kingdom, not, not, not by a long shot, but when it comes to ranges of colors um, and color differentiation, we, we definitely are higher up there. Tigers are the largest cat species in the world and third largest carnivore on land. Um, the only ones that are larger would be the brown bear, the grizzly bear, um, and the polar bear, which we've covered on the podcast as well. Um, so if you haven't listened to the polar bear episode, you can, you can do that on your own time. Um, whenever you'd like, but um, polar bears are very, very large animals, um, considerably larger than tigers by weight and by size, um, but the, the uh, tigers are the largest cat species in the world. Of course, polar bears and brown bears are not cats, um, so still, um, we're going to give a point to tigers for being the largest cat species, um, which is surprising to me. Um, I thought that maybe lions would be on that list, but I suppose that tigers are, are higher up there. Um, and the third largest carnivore on land, I mean, top three in the world, largest carnivore, that is, a, that is an achievement. Um, so a Siberian tiger is also called an Amur, 
um, I don't know if I'm saying that correctly, A-M-U-R, Amur, Amur, or Amur, I'm going to say Amur. Um, so an adult Siberian tiger, which is the largest subspecies of any tiger, can weigh up to 660 pounds. So very large for an animal that really pri- that, that is a, a carnivore and one that hunts, one that really has to be agile uh, for its particular prey. So weighing up to 660 pounds, that is very impressive. That is a very big animal. Um, but of course, the Siberian tiger is the largest of the bunch. Um, if you haven't seen Siberian tigers before, um, those of you that really like animal documentaries just like me, I think there is one actually on Netflix that, that, that um, revolves particularly around um, trying to spot a Siberian tiger because they are, due to um, habitat loss, they are very, very uh, rare to find in the wild. They also avoid people, um, whether that's an adaptation or not. Um, it's, it's very possible because humans are kind of the main threat to their survival at this point. Um, it's, it's, there are some amazing documentaries regarding Siberian tigers, so I very recommend any of you listeners that enjoy documentaries to check it out. Um, the Sumatran tiger is the smallest of the bunch, so in contrast to that Siberian tiger, with males only weighing up to 310 pounds. So we can see just in subspecies, we have a difference of 350 pounds approximately. So that is huge. Um, females generally weigh less than males in all subspecies. So this is very common. It is not too common for uh, animals in the animal kingdom um, to uh, have females weigh more than males. Um, I'm sure it exists, but at least on the um, on this podcast, we've covered 26 animals. I don't remember one where females are larger um, than the male species. So very common. Um, tigers are the only cat species that are completely striped. Um, and if you were to, I'm not suggesting anybody do this, um, but if you were to shave off all of their hair with, you know, I imagined that they w- it would just be bare, but actually they do have stripes on their skin. So um, don't let the fur deceive you. They have stripes on their skin as well, which is very, very interesting. Not something I expected. Um, oftentimes the color of the coat can be misleading, just like on the polar bear episode, going back to that episode, we talked about how, uh, spoiler alert, um, polar bears have black skin, jet black skin right underneath their very white coat. So um, sometimes it's not exactly what meets the eye, but in the case of the tiger, they are very consistent. Their their fur is the same color um, or has the same striped kind of pigmentation as their skin underneath. Very, very cool. Um, stripe density will vary by subspecies. So for example, the stripes on a Sumatran tiger are closer together than those uh, on any other subspecies. So, I think that's 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 I think that's a really cool fact because um, such a small thing like stripe density varying by subspecies. Um, I wonder if maybe because of these subspecies uh, living in uh, slightly different conditions or having to do with other kind of environmental factors, that would cause a difference in stripe density. But um, there might not be a reason. Evolution is really interesting, very complex in how it works, sometimes completely random, most often times completely random. Um, so I just think it's, uh, I think it's really cool. Stripe density varies by subspecies. So when it comes to differentiating um, tigers within a population, um, no two tigers will have the same stripes. Um, so it says here, it's written down here, that like human fingerprints, their stripe patterns are unique to each individual. Now, this I question just a little bit. Um, maybe it's because their populations are so low, but even in the course of human history, we have found that fingerprints are not always 100% unique. There have been cases where individuals have the same fingerprint. Um, of course, we're talking human beings that have a population of over 7.5 billion at this point, but... Um, I, I, so I suppose that maybe in these small populations, we'll talk about population sizes in a second. Um, I suppose maybe in um, in these smaller populations, this can be th- th- this can absolutely be the case. Um, but um, in an ideal world where there's more tigers, um, I don't think that it is possible to have a 100% unique pattern for each um, tiger. Um, but I suppose in the, in the smaller populations. Um, and stripes range in color from light brown to black and are not symmetrical on both sides of the tiger. So 
Um, they're not 100% symmetrical. Uh, this is this is something that that um, I expected. I didn't expect. Just like I, I assume zebras are, are the same way. Um, let's talk about a tiger's tail. So a tiger's tail is about three feet long and helps them balance when making tight turns. So cheetahs, for example, another large cat um, known for its incredibly fast speeds of up to 90, 90 something, 93, I think, kilometers an hour or 95. So the fastest cat in the world, cheetah, for example, also uses its tail for turns. This has to do with um, this has to do with momentum and different kinds of, um, uh, I guess, physical sort of uh, properties. But of course, I don't think that the tiger and the cheetah have done uh, their share of physics homework. This is more something innate that they just understand, um, and nature takes the wheel with that. Um, but I just think it's so cool that it's kind of like aerodynamically how it works. Um, but we're not going to go into physics on this podcast. We're not trying to stress anybody out here, <laughs> any of you physics majors out there. Um, it's estimated that tiger hunts um, are only successful about one in every 10 to 20 attempts. So very common as well for um, a lot of predators, um, especially for the big cat species. Um, this is, so, Ah! The success rates are not too high for a multitude of reasons, not only because of habitat loss and things like that, um, but um, not only are the predators very much ad- uh, adapted to be able to hunt, um, their prey is very well adapted to be able to sense danger and survive. So um, we have to remember that you know tigers are amazing, um, amazing hunters, but um, hunting is a lot harder for them than running away, I suppose. Um, also depending on the prey species. Um, an adult tiger can consume up to 88 pounds of meat in one meal and will often stay with its kill or bury it to return and dine over a period of days. So a tiger consuming up to 88 pounds of meat in one meal, this can be something, um, this I assume is is, is an adaptation because um, if you're talking about one success in every 10 to 20 attempts, they don't know when their next meal is going to be, so they better Um, they better dine, you know, dine for days. Um, And it may not kill again for four or five days. So this was something that I found super interesting that um, was posted by the, I think, the Rantham Boar National Park. Here they stated that um, tigers, some tigers hunt by mimicry. Um, I've talked about mimicry before on the podcast, but it's basically imitating um, another species or another animal for either the benefit of survival, um, I mean mainly for the benefit of survival, whether it's defense reasons or predatory reasons. Um, So it has been said that tigers make a pook sound, that's P-O-O-K, a pook sound similar to that of sambar um, that will draw innocent animals into the trap to be able to get ambushed. Now, I've watched documentaries before. I have not seen this before, but I just thought it was interesting to include it, so don't um, take it with a grain of salt because I am not entirely sure about that fact. Um, but if it is true, um, hunting by mimicry, tigers, that is completely new information to me. Um, a tiger's canine teeth have pressure sensing nerves, so it knows exactly where to deliver the killing bite to their prey. So another very cool adaptation um, and one that I imagine was really hard to figure out. Um, you know, finding out whether they have pressure sensing nerves or not. Um, but this, I also question just a little bit. Um, of course, it's great to be skeptical whenever you read these things. Um, I just kind of um, think about it. And does that mean that the tiger will run its teeth along um, along its prey to see where specifically it should go or how that, how that works exactly? So, um, I'm sure that it is true that they do have pressure sensing nerves. I just don't know how that um, works um, because usually the hunt, you know, they don't have time to really search for the best pressure to dig their teeth into. I would think that mostly they um, know by natural instinct or experience of some kind, Um, but nonetheless, very interesting. Um, It is also said that the whiskers that tigers have help them navigate in the dark and attack prey. So this I can, this I can definitely see. Um, and if we're talking about the average lifespan of a wild tiger, is is a, it's about ten to fifteen years, um, but on a rare occasion they have been known to uh, live up to twenty six years in the wild. 
Now, I did not find any facts specifically to um, tigers in captivity. Uh, generally, as we've seen on the podcast, animals in uh, captivity are able to live longer amounts of time. Now, whether or not those animals have a better quality of life, of course, is something that has been debated. Um, but I did not find something to do with that. But mostly animals in captivity are, they are able to be treated for uh, different diseases and stuff like that. Um, of course, in the wild, it's a totally different uh, uh, ball game there. But um, so yeah, 10 to 15 years, we're talking average there. Um, and they say that female tigers are super moms. So gestation periods, so one thing we talk about a lot on the podcast. Um, they have a gestation period of a little more than three months, and they give birth on average to two to three blind and helpless cubs. So um, very, very common for cubs to come out blind and completely helpless. It's, 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 um, it's something that's very common among species. Um, and the female is going to be the sole provider for them until they reach independence uh, at around two years of age. So we're talking two to three kids um, for two years. Um, so definitely super moms. That's that's awesome. Now having two to three offspring is something that is um, I I would think that among all species before I started this podcast um, I thought that two to three was sort of the average But I see that many species just like we covered last time uh, for example uh, for the otter um, That was a great episode um, that they like to give birth sort of one at a time because it can it can be like a handful um, so um, the female tiger is preferring two to three helpless cubs. This could be um, also an adaptation possibly um, to uh, make sure that at least maybe one of them uh, gets to be uh, gets to be an adult and pass on those genetics. Um, unlike most big cats, and those of you who have regular cats out there at home as house pets, um, you know that maybe notoriously they do not like water. From all the videos I've seen on the internet of cats not liking to go into, uh, not liking to get their baths and things like that. Tigers, however, are very powerful swimmers, and they have been known to swim great distance, uh, great distances to hunt, or just to cross rivers, I suppose, to hunt on the other side. And the young tigers often play in water, and adults will sort of lounge in the streams or lakes to stay cool during the heat of the day. So, with their habitat, it is very hot, of course, and they have a very thick coat of fur. Um, this does not, um, of course, the hot habitat does not cover all species of tiger. Um, of course, when we're talking the Siberian tiger, we are not talking about hot savanna plains here. Um, so um, the adults will like to just chill in the water a little bit, um, maybe have a pool floaty. Uh, the young tigers will uh, often just uh, play in the water. So it's kind of a it's kind of like a family uh, play date, I suppose. So tigers do not live in permanent groups like lions do. So lions um, very famously uh, stick together mostly, um, but for the most part, tigers prefer solitary lives. Of course, except um, when females are raising cubs. Um, although rarely seen, there is a term for a group of tigers, and it is called the streak. I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, so a group of tigers is called the uh, streak. And a tiger's roar is the roar that I always imagined when I, was a, when I was a kid what lions sounded like. But lions have a very interesting kind of roar, and um, I guess we'll cover it another time. Um, but a lion's roar sounds almost like a gurgle, something I never would have associated with a lion because I always imagined this majestic kind of animal. While they're very majestic, um, I expected the tiger's roar to be coming out of the lion's mouth. Um, so a tiger's roar is, 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 is what you, you would expect a lion to sound like. If you've never heard a lion before, you can search it up. Um, and you can hear them from uh, up to two miles away. Um, and they have different vocalizations that include hissing, growling, roaring, moaning, and uh, chuffing. So um, a lot of different vocalizations. It didn't say specifically what each one. I, I, I mean, I, I, I can guess what some of them, you know, with hissing and growling and stuff like that. But for example, chuffing or, or roaring. Um, because roaring, I don't imagine a tiger would really waste its time too much um, when it's going for prey. I suppose when it has something um, 
that is threatening its survival specifically. It would probably roar, that's what I imagine. Tigers are generally nocturnal hunters. So nocturnal, those of you that aren't familiar with the word, this means um, awake during the night, asleep during the day. So their night vision is up to six times greater than ours. Um, and they are opportunistic sort of hunters, which means uh, they won't pass up the chance for a daytime snack if it's available. Say they're sleeping and they see something that, that is um, able to, uh, that they are able to catch, they will, uh, of course, um, kind of get up and, and um, go to work during the day as well. Um, so nocturnal hunters. So a tiger's hind legs are longer than its front legs, which is something that I would have guessed probably. Um, and it will give them the ability to leap 20 to 30 feet in one jump. So let's think about that for a second. I think the average human um, is probably somewhere in the range of 5'2", five, 5'3", five, I think somewhere over there, somewhere in the 5 feet. Um, so we're talking, um, they can jump over sometimes 6 times the height of a human being, um, which is just incredible. Um, so it is really cool that they have also this adaptation. Um, I find evolution to be so so very interesting um, that they're built anatomically, physiologically this way to be able to uh, leap these large distances to close the gaps if they need to. And we talked about the cheetah, which is a very fast runner, but um, tigers also run very, very quickly. They're not the fastest, but um, due to the fact that they have these strong legs, they can sprint close to 60 to 65 kilometers an hour, um, but if, but this is only possible for short distances. Um, as is very common for a lot of these uh, explosive hunters, um, the window for a uh, the window to actually be able to catch the prey is very small, so they will expend a huge amount of energy in that in that small time, not making it possible to have that 60 kilometer per hour uh, sprint a very long lasting ordeal. Tigers have large padded feet that make it easier for them to silently stalk their prey. So as we talked about before, these animals can range from 300 to over 600 pounds. So making sure to have um, that really large surface area um, on their feet to make it easier to stalk is, is, would be absolutely crucial to their survival. If they did not have as large a surface area or maybe not padded, um, they could be very clumsy in the way that they walk and they would not last very long as a species. Um, just because if you're trying to, uh, uh, a lot of these, these uh, prey, like the prey that they go for, has very sensitive hearing to changes in their environment. So if they don't have a very um, adept way of approaching, then that would be bad news for the tigers. But luckily they have big paws. But these paws are extremely strong. So tigers are ambush predators, as we've been talking about, and they prefer to sneak up on their prey before exploding into action, so something that you would already probably know, and they will kill them with a bite to the neck or to the back of the head. And the main prey that they look for are deer, wild boar, buffalo, and antelope, and they'll kill and eat what's available generally. Um, we're talking small birds to even bears and to the occasional elephant, which I found really interesting. We've covered elephants before on the, po uh, on the podcast, both Asian and African elephants. As, we've, as we uh, know, they can be very, very large in size, um, you know, up to 13,000 pounds. So that is very cool. Um, and they have white spots on the back of their ears. And they have been thought to function as eyes to ward off potential attackers from the rear. So, of course, they don't have as much protection from the back um, because these are ambush predators, so having those uh, little white spots maybe can ward off a potential attacker um, looking from behind if they somehow are able to ambush a tiger. So another very cool adaptation. Another separate theory is that it helps tiger cubs follow their mothers through tall grass. So, um, of course, I, I imagine that it would be really hard to test, um, test either one here. Um, scientifically, but I think that those that, that's really cool. So we have two theories. One, ward off potential attackers from the rear, and two, maybe help little tiger cubs be able to follow uh, mothers through their tall grass as they might not be as used to um, uh, navigating those, those environments just yet. So white tigers are not a separate subspecies, nor are they actually albino. They are, okay, this, this is a tough word, um, leucistic, 
So this is a result of a recessive gene. Any of you that are in biology maybe would know about uh, genes and, and stuff like that. Um, so it's a result of a recessive gene from each parent that affects the pigmentation. And white tigers will typically have blue eyes as well. So white and blue eyes. So I imagine very rare um, and very beautiful to look at. So for the final fact here, um, we're just going to talk about how tigers are a very, very integral species to the environment. So as we've covered in the podcast before, um, the animals, every animal that I've covered has a very key role in the environment it plays. So tigers specifically are very integral to the health of the ecosystems in which they live specifically. So um, as the apex predators, they will keep prey species under control. Um, which will in turn protect vegetation, which also w will in turn maintain integrity of streams, croplands, forests, you name it, um, which of course will provide people with water, food, um, clean air, things like that. Um, so this is why it is so important that we protect species, um, and in this episode, the tiger in particular, um, because they are so, so crucial to the uh, integrity of the environment. Um, and if you're wondering how many species, uh, how, what the populations are like, so the surviving tiger subspecies right now are the South China tiger, the Siberian tiger, the Sumatran tiger, the Indo-Chinese tiger, uh, Malayan tiger, and Bengal tiger. And between all of those subspecies that I just named, the population is estimated at only 3,000 to 4,500 left in the wild which is very, very sad, especially because they have such a crucial role to play. For those of you that are interested in helping out with that, um, there are plenty of websites and organizations that help uh, protect these animals. I think most importantly, um, I like this podcast because it's it, it helps to, I guess, um, spread the word a little bit and make uh, people more aware of what's going on and also just to have a, um, a very... Uh, in-depth look at some of these beautiful animals. Um, now for the final um, fact, well, we already said the final fact, but the fact I always love to end the podcast on is the name. Where does the name come from? So in 1758, Carl Linnaeus gave the tiger the name Felis t uh, Tigrisus, Tigrisus? Uh, with Latin, I, I almost never know how to pronounce it. Um, and Felis relates to the genus of mostly small cats. So, um, in 1929, so this is, um, so it was 1758, now we're talking about 1929, Reginald Enos uh, Pocock, a British taxonomist, uh, he declared the animal as part of the genus Panthera instead of Felis, which uh, changed its name to Panthera tigris. Panthera meaning leopard and uh, tigris meaning tiger. So I just thought that was kind of cool that the name has been through, uh, its scientific name at least, has been through um, some kind of transformation there. So um, it took about 150 years for them to change it. So we're gonna we're still going to give props to Carl Linnaeus for initially giving the name Felis tigrisus, even though Reginald decided that it's better if it was Panthera tigris um, for, I suppose, a variety of different reasons um, for the change of the genus there. So thank you all so very much for tuning in. I really hope you enjoyed the show. Um, I thought that, that the tiger was a really interesting one, especially now I was made aware, um, well, I was reminded that Tiger King on Netflix is something that is very, very popular right now and maybe people would be interested to learn in the tiger. So I very much hope you enjoyed the show. If you have any notes, um, if, I, if I said something incorrectly, or there's maybe you can say it in a way better than I can, uh, or you would like to have a, uh, an animal on the podcast, go ahead and send an email to relaxwithanimalfacts at gmail.com, and I will get back to you, and maybe you can be featured on the podcast. So thank you all so very much for listening, and I will see you on the next podcast episode with the next animal. Take care.